All right, here we are again, another Sunday morning. Hopefully everything's going good for people. I'll wait till things get all hooked up here, I guess. Okay, I see I'm on over here on the other screen. So, morning everybody. Hope everyone is doing well. So, um, what we're going to be doing today, uh, good morning everybody, uh, what we're going to be doing today when we actually start into going into the Bible and what we're going to be looking at the sermon. Um, I'm going to be hiding the chat. A bunch of you suggested that, and and uh, good suggestion. I think it's important because you know you need to be at, you know paying attention here to what the scriptures say. Check what I'm saying to to be you know true. Very important, and uh, that way we can all stay focused on the Word of God and. Uh, so, and then afterwards, you know, we can have some questions, but they should be, you know, relating to what we were studying. I want people to, you know, pay attention. Not because I'm important or whatever else, but you know what I'm saying. Um, well, 35 degrees Celsius in Belgium, yeah, that would be warm. That's warm here too. It's uh, I don't enjoy the high temperatures very much. So, I'm just gonna wait till 10 o'clock so everybody can get, kind of get in. Then we'll take some prayer requests and then we'll get started. So. Ninety-five Fahrenheit, huh? That's hot. Anything much above eighty degrees, I don't like. I'm, uh, I like cold weather. I don't really like the high temperatures and things. We've been getting a lot of it this summer here in Maine. Unfortunately, I was kind of happy to be here in northern climate like this, but now it's been so hot. It's just not been much fun. <laughs> So, fifty two there, wow. Fahrenheit, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Thirty four degrees here from the Netherlands. Just about ready to get started here. Now, yeah. no, I didn't stand for the truth. I didn't see that. I haven't really been paying attention. Wow, Italy, 111 Fahrenheit. Yikes. <laughs> That's hot. Okay, I wouldn't definitely wouldn't like that. All right. Um, okay. 83 in Texas. Huh. All right. Well, let's get started. We're going to start out with prayer requests this morning. Um, so go ahead and fire when ready. Anybody have any prayer requests over there? Just write them in the comments. I'll write them down here, and then we'll start out with prayer. Pray for what you have there. Good morning, everybody. Prayer requests, anyone? Go ahead and write them out, and we will we'll 
start out with prayer. Okay. Got yours there, Brother Matt. Venezuela. Um, all right, I see that. Um, Um, better write fast. <laughs> Life. Um, I guess I'm not safe. Okay, you got yours there. Chad Stewart. Um, greater sanctification. Got it. Hi. There, KGV in Lane, South Dakota. Prayers for my wife. She has been having contractions, waiting for the baby to come. Prayed for us last week, brother. Appreciate another one. We want the baby to come already. <laughs> yeah, I understand. It's been a while ago that we had our son, but I, I get it. Um, uh, safe delivery of baby. Um, Nation, um, Chris and Evie, Chris and Evie, um, Catholic mother, okay. Ed. Me, me, Tana, me, Tana, I guess, uh, salvation. Um, Uh, kind of getting a little bit behind here. The rings for some justice to over Mars. Um, okay, and mother. All right, I'm getting really far behind here. Um, Okay.
knows this one causing me trouble. Um, I'm run out of paper here soon. Okay. Faster. Typing might be faster. Probably not. Not for me. I type with two fingers. I'm not very coordinated with typing. Um, I think we'll stop here with the prayer request because I'm running out of paper here. Uh, personal fellowship. Jeez. I used to do that at one of the Baptist churches I used to attend. Um, so, sister, um, yeah, yeah, I, I could, you know, have people email and stuff, but you know, I can, I just write the basics here real quickly, and I kind of, okay, I kind of know what we're doing. So, all right, um, I guess I'm gonna hide the chat now, and um, we're gonna do our opening prayer here this morning, and then we're going to get into what does the Bible say about church hierarchy, okay? Is it that we're all just equal and that nobody should have any kind of authority in the church or are there positions of authority and what do those positions entail? Is it that you become a pope or something or can you be questioned? Whatever. That's what we're going to go over today. Um, I don't think I've ever done an actual study on this. So it's an important study. A lot of scripture to go through. So we're going to do the hide the chat thing here. And uh, we'll bring the chat back after the study is done. But let's let's get started here. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I do come here before you this morning with a, a number of requests from the body of Christ out there. And I just want to start out, Lord, with uh, Brother Matthew. He goes through some pain with the uh, disease that he has there. And I just pray, Lord, for comfort and that you would please guide him into the paths of of natural healing and things that, that you would maybe even reveal some things to him that would help him with his pain and with his um, issue that he has. Um, I'm not even sure, Lord, all that's going on with Venezuela. I know that the, there's a lot of things down there with um, the suffering. I, I'm pretty sure it's the one that has the suffering with the economy and, and uh, a lot of people just are starving and it's it's pretty bad down there. Um, yeah, I think it's that. It's because I'm thinking Argentina, but now it's Venezuela. Lord, you know what's going on. And I just pray that that you could use these tragedies down there to turn people to you because you're the only hope that they have. I, I pray, Lord, for uh, Charles Perillo, for his wife. Um, I won't say her name here, but uh, you know who she is. And uh, But for safe travels for her. when she has to drive alone. I, I know um, I worry for my wife sometimes and things if she's driving uh, without me being there. So I just pray that you keep her safe. Um, Lord, for uh, Chad Stewart, for his lost family members, that's a reoccurring prayer request, Lord, for a lot of us. Uh, just people that we love and, and care about, but they're lost and they don't know you, Lord. I pray that you give him chances to witness to his family members and all of us, Lord, chances to witness to lost loved ones. Um, I pray for um, Billy Rader and his uh, very good prayer request, Lord, for sanctification and just um, that you would continue to uh, show us, Lord, what areas we need to change and, and get stronger in uh, so that we might be closer to you. I think that should be a request that all of us have. And um, I pray for the brother that, that uh, his wife is with child and soon to be delivered. I pray, Lord, that it would go well and it'd be a safe delivery. And um, 
that uh, you would just be there with them and comfort her in that time of uh, pain that will come and rem remind her that it's just a temporary thing and that the joy of holding a newborn baby in her arms is going to make all that pain go away very quickly. And um, I just pray, Lord, that you would be with them in this time. Um, I pray for uh, Keon Mackey for family salvation there again. Another one that uh, lost family members, Lord, give them a chance to witness to them. I pray for Chris and Evie for their Catholic uh, mother there, just for his Catholic mother, I believe. Um, Catholics, Lord, they're just they're bound up in this system of lies and deception. And I just pray, Lord, that you would open up her eyes and that she would see the deception that she's that she's part of and this wicked system that she's part of and with all the child molestation and all the horrible things that the Pope is doing and, and whatever else, Lord, I pray for Catholics everywhere that they would wake up to what's going before it's too before what what's going on before it's too late. Um, I pray, Lord, for Ed Smiatana, if I'm saying that right, for salvation. And I pray, Lord, for Luke James. Um, for his grandfather as he's seems to be on his deathbed there Lord and, and I pray that he would get saved um, That you would maybe just do something to shake him up or I know that a lot of times the elderly when they get To the point of where when they're on their deathbed a lot of times they they've just rejected you their whole life And it's very hard to get them saved at that point in time because their heart is hardened through the deceitfulness of sin But you can still get in there Lord and shake him up somehow and make him think of the uh, of the fact that he's heading to hell. Um, so I do pray for that. Um, the Black Lives Matter and Antifa, Lord, for justice. Somebody requested that. Um, these very evil people, Lord. It isn't just some kind of another system or they these people hate you and they're just they're being allowed to just get away with murder. And I know it's leading to the alt right movement um, being used and things. So it's it's just a real messy situation, Lord, but they are doing very evil things. And spreading some real serious hatred, Lord. I pray that you would put an end to it. Adam Theory, for his grandmother's salvation. Um, I pray, Lord, again, that you give him a chance to witness to her. Um, and the one brother that witnessed to some Muslims, I just pray that they would think about uh, what they heard and realize the lie that they're in. Um, I pray for the sister that uh, would like to, for her and her husband and things to get away from the city and get to living in an off-grid situation. Um, Lord, if I can uh, do more messages on that in the future, then I pray, Lord, that you would put those into my mind to help me to be able to advise people better because it is a beautiful life, Lord. And I, I pray for all those who um, are in the cities or in towns. I know it's difficult to leave, but I pray that they would make that, that choice, if at all possible, at least get to a smaller town or something and get out of the big cities because of what's happening and what's coming. Um, I do pray, Lord, for the unspoken request. Um, I just, you know what it is, Lord, and I just pray that you would please take care of that. Um, for someone, their aunt hails uh, that somebody is causing her trouble. I do pray for that as well, Lord, that you would just uh, help her to have strength. I don't know if she saved or lost or whatever else, Lord. I just pray that you would help her to have strength to get through that. And if she's not saved, I pray that maybe that situation would would uh, turn her to you as her real source of protection. Um, and the prayer, Lord, for those in ministry, um, I pray, Lord, that for myself, that you would please help me to stay true and, and not fall away and not get messed up. And for all those out there, the same thing. Those of us that stand by your word, um, that truly believe the King James Bible and, and not just... Um, give lip service to the King James Bible and, and say in all matters of faith and practice and then don't follow through with it. Um, these Baptist preachers out there, Lord, that, that pretend that they believe your word and then they live very false, very wicked lives. Lord, I pray for your judgment to be upon them. And, um, and uh, in-person fellowship opportunities, Lord. Uh, this internet thing is great. A lot of neat things that we can learn from each other and, and hear from each other. And I love the fellowship that we have, but I pray that each of us would have more chances to, to meet up with other believers in person. That you could arrange those things as, as more of that as time goes by. And now, Lord, I pray that we would all be attentive to your word and to the things which we need to learn from your word. That you would please speak through me, Lord. Help me to say things that are in line with your word. And, um, 
just uh, pray that we would all follow along in our King James Bibles. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So there's that. Um, so. All right, we are going to talk today about church hierarchy. All right, um, what does the Bible have to say about it? So let's start in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, turn there in your King James Bible. I guess I didn't get to, to shut the chat off over here. Okay, how do I how do I shut the chat off? I I turned it off. Okay, I, I'm doing it there on YouTube. I thought that was enough. <laughs> um, how do you shut the chat off? I'm not even sure how to do that. Is it? I'm not. I I have no idea. I thought just do it over here on the. I have Streamyard thing is up over here. I'm not sure on Streamyard how to do it. Um, general, no, that's not it. I thought I had it, but no, I guess not. Okay. Um, we're using, I'm using StreamYard, Brother Adam. I, I don't know. Just looking over here at comments. I have no idea. It's under community. Okay. Um, yeah, below the chat states hide chat. Um, but that's just on YouTube. Under community and settings. I don't see anything about community in the settings. All right. Well, I can't. I can't see anything there. Comments. It's not doing anything. All right. Well, whatever. I, I just forget about it. Just to, you know, hide your chat thing. Whatever else there. I don't. I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that. Um, whatever. Turn your Bible to First Corinthians chapter twelve, verses twenty-seven through thirty-one. We'll start there. And, um, you know, just you can hide the chat probably on your own thing there and whatever else. Um, so I'm just going to do this here quick. Yeah, I can't see the chat now. <laughs> All right. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And Paul goes into, in chapter 13, to talk about charity which is the bond of perfectness. It's it's what we need to have. We need to have fervent charity there. But I read these verses specifically here because I believe 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is still somewhat transitional. It's still there. The, the signs are given to confirm the word. Um, there is some application to today, but you get into the, like the miracles thing. I know somebody asked me that one of the live streams I did question and answer time. And I said, I, I don't know. What would be a miracle today? I mean, we've seen miraculous things. Um, 
you know, in our lives. All of us have, have experienced that at some point in time. Wow, I can't be believe the Lord worked it out this way. Well, it's, you know, miraculous type of a deal. But the working of miracles, can you say it's for today? I don't really know. But the point I'm, I'm trying to make by reading this portion of scripture is we're all members of the body of Christ. Okay. Verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. So we're all members of the body of Christ. But that doesn't mean we all have the same exact thing that we're supposed to do. We have the same exact gifts. We're all just programmed robots when you get saved or something. No. There are people that have different talents, different abilities. So I shouldn't attack you people out there for not having a video ministry. And then likewise, don't attack me because I have one and I don't do whatever like you would do. Okay. Some of us have better abilities to learn languages. I'm pretty horrible at it. I wish I could learn languages better, you know, tongues in the passage here, but I'm just not that good at it. Well, then I'm just no good or something. No, some other brother or sister can learn the languages. See, we're not supposed to just all be the same is the point of that passage. But let's actually go now to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to see the actual thing of um, having structure within the body of Christ. We're going to get into a lot of this in, in great detail. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 is where we'll start. Give everybody a minute to get there. I just took my sword searcher software and just stuck it over there over the top of the comments. So I have no idea if anybody's saying anything. So not that I don't care. It's just that, you know, we're giving the word of God time here. Um, but uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Okay. The Lord thinks very highly of women. Okay. That's why I read verses 9 and 10. Verse 11. The Lord's not putting you down if you're a woman. Let the women or the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Compared to 1 Corinthians 14, it's right there. It doesn't mean you can't ever witness as a Christian lady. You can't ever talk about the Lord if there's other Christians around. It's saying when you have a meeting of the body of Christ where people are gathered together in person, hey, remain silent, please. There is supposed to be male authority in the church. So whenever you have a female pastor, she's wrong. She's not right with God. Okay. Um, that's very important to understand that. Verse 13. So we do see, okay, we're all members of body of the body of Christ. Sure, absolutely. But we all have different gifts. And women don't have the gift of being, you know, in the you know, role of being a, a preacher or a teacher there. They don't have that role. That's a role for a man. Right, male authority in the church. Right, verse thirteen. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Very important there, the thing of sobriety. Um, but again, you see the thing there also with charity. Paul says, "I show you a more excellent way," um, and that's charity. So what do we see? What have we learned so far? Okay, we're all members of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. We're saved, we're born again. That is the church, right? But we don't all have the same gifts and we don't all have the same authority. So we have established, we have different gifts. And number two, male authority in the church. That's the way it is, right? Now let's go on to the actual qualifications for a bishop in chapter three. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Interesting because some of the new versions say if anyone desires the office of a bishop. I've covered that in some of my studies. No, the Bible's very clearly it's a man that desires the office of a bishop. Bishop is just another word for elder, okay, or it's like a description of pastor. You don't go around saying, I am Bishop Brian or something. No, no, no. There are no titles given in there. Um, they're not addressing one another by pastor, you know, Paul or whatever. It's just brother or, you know, when I talk to a woman, it's, you know, sister. 
right? But if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. It's a good work, in other words, to do. It's not some kind of a horrible, bad thing or whatever else. And it is. It is, it is a good work to be in ministry. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. All right, now let's look at this in, in detail. Must be blameless. Well, he has to be sinlessly perfect. No, no. Nobody is going to be sinlessly perfect. You get that thing put on me all the time. You teach work salvation. You teach sinless perfection. No, I do not. Blameless simply means you aren't carrying around a bunch of baggage and whatever else that criminal history and whatever other kind of things and stuff. If you get in trouble, you, you say, okay, let me explain this thing here, whatever. Or if you really are messed up, you step down from the ministry. Um, and here we get into something that's very important, a very important concept in scripture, and that is age, right? Um, Timothy was a younger man, and we're going to look at this in detail as we go through this study. But there should be some age there. And we're going to see this down up, down in here a little bit. Again, you know, he's supposed to be the husband of one wife. You know, uh, right there. Blameless, the husband of one wife. He should have a good marriage. Vigilant. What does vigilant mean? Well, vigilant mean, he, means that he's aware of certain things that are going on. And, there's, and he looks for dangers that could affect the body of Christ. All right. Oh, oh, wait a second. Hey, wait, this is this is bad here. Hey, everybody watch out for this. And that should come in a lot of different forms. And, you know, we all need to be that. But uh, a man that's a bishop, a man in ministry is really supposed to be that. Um, be aware of what's going on. Sober. He shouldn't be some kind of a acting like a fool or whatever else. Of good behavior. How does that happen with a young man? All this stuff happens. You're going to learn a lot of this through experience. You go, you know, a real, real young man, you get some of these guys, you know, teenage preachers, you know, like Bob Jones Sr. You know, I think it was, what, 13 years old or something when he started preaching. You're not old enough when you're 13. No way. No way. Again, as I've said many times, Jesus Christ started his earthly ministry when he was 30. Are you better than Jesus? You know, you need to learn some things before you get into ministry. Given to hospitality, okay, you can't be some kind of a, a hermit and whatever else. And of course, people say, what about you, Denley, or what about you? I am given to hospitality. I actually like to be around people. We choose to live out in the middle of nowhere. But, you know, when it comes to fellowshipping with people, I'm not against that. You know, people don't understand. You know, what you see on YouTube is primarily a ministry, a public ministry to get people saved and to get people that are in the whole church building scam. To get them out of that and realize, hey, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, study the word. Here's some answers to your questions. But ultimately, you need to have the Bible and yourself and the Lord. All right. And, you know, if you can form a local fellowship there, people in your area and whatever else to meet with and things. And, and it starts to grow to a point where you say, OK, we need a bishop. OK, then here's the qualifications in Scripture. Um, given the hospitality apt to teach. Uh, a man that is truly qualified for ministry is going to be excited about teaching the word of God. And that takes time. That isn't some kind of a just, oh, you know, I'll just do that in my off time and whatever. You know, you really want to get into a lot of teaching and, and, and things. It, it takes a lot of study. Uh, verse three, not given to wine. All right. Doesn't say you can't drink wine because Paul recommends wine for Timothy. Um, it's not that you have to be this um, into this real strict temperance type of a movement or whatever. Um, I personally am. I'm, I'm just of the opinion, well, you shouldn't drink at all, you know, because I, I don't I don't waste time with it. I've had wine before. I think it tastes like cough syrup. I have no desire for alcohol. But uh, what's going on there is you can drink, but you're not given to it. It's not always something that you have to have your drink every day. You have to, you know, I just have to have a little bit of wine just all the time. And that's you're playing with fire. No striker. OK, um, you need to have some maturity there. All right. Don't be a striker. Don't be just one to hit everybody and just hit everything and, and whatever else. Also very important. Not greedy of filthy lucre. OK, very simple test for you if you are in ministry. All right. What would you do 
if somebody gave you one million dollars and you're a man in ministry what would you do with it very simple question and if you start thinking to yourself oh boy I could get a you know a much nicer house and oh I could get that I could buy a new vehicle and I could if you think about those types of things eh, you're might be in there you know in ministry for filthy lucre okay filthy money is what it's talking about uh, covetousness and things and, and having those idols in your life uh, stuff that, that you want people to think that you're this great person whatever else if you can say you know what if I had a million dollars yeah I'd, I'd probably you know buy a few things that I need but man what can I do for the Lord with that money how many Bibles could I buy and give to people or, or maybe I could hire some more people to make the ministry more effective and, and Hmm. I wonder if we could, you know, send some to a missionary someplace that's actually doing some good work. And, and, you know, you think about things of the Lord. Okay, then you're not somebody that's greedy of filthy lucre. All right. I'll tell you right now, somebody comes up to me and says, here's a million dollars. I can guarantee you and promise you I am not going to try to invest any private airplane. Couldn't afford one anyways with a million dollars. If I wanted one like Kenneth Copeland, $27 million. Guy's such a devil, but I don't want a private airplane. I don't want a mansion on this earth. It's too hard to heat and too much headache. Um, I I don't want a big fancy car. I don't like big fancy cars, you know. But I mean, go down through list a yacht or a, a go to vacations on exotic places. That stuff's not even interesting to me, you know. So, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. How does patience come when you're young? Hmm. Takes a little while to be patient. Not a brawler. Kind of like the thing of no striker. Not covetous. Kind of like the thing of not greedy of filthy lucre. Um, and although it's interesting because covetous, uh, you know, we're not to be covetous of the things of this world, but yet 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, covet earnestly the best gifts. So we are supposed to covet things that are in here. Boy, if I could just, you know, learn to heal people better. If I could just, you know, be bold, more bold in my witnessing to people. If I could, if, oh man, I just wish I knew the Bible better. I wish I could just quote whole chapters from memory. And, oh man, I just wish I knew all the old hymns by heart. And I could, oh, if I could play an instrument and really play a lot of these hymns, I don't know. I can see them in the hymn book and covet earnestly the best gifts. See? Verse 4, and I'm going to park on this one for a little bit. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Verse 5, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Yeah, this whole Stephen Anderson thing came out, and all his boys and this Aaron Thompson, another pastor in the new IFB, their boys are saying all this vile, horrible stuff and everything else, and oh, it's not the pastor's fault. It's the children that are doing this. That is nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. That is denying verses 4 and 5 here for the qualifications of a bishop. It is nonsense. I realize a, a child, when they get older, they can make their own decision and whatever. Uh, Peter Ruckman, his son, Peter Jr., shot his boys and then shot himself. He said, well, that's Ruckman's fault. Well, first of all, Peter Ruckman Sr. was dead at the time. Um, and secondly, Peter Ruckman Jr., when he did that, he was in his 50s. I don't think that that can be blamed on Peter Ruckman Sr. anymore. Okay, um, It's his own house. When the children are still in your house, you have control over them. All right. Um, so what about you, Brian? You have a son, Oliver. He's going to get bad. You, you watch. You know, and stuff. Um, well, let's see. My son's not allowed to play video games. He doesn't watch television. He has no access to the internet with a smartphone or something that he sits around with. We feed him a natural food diet, no sugar, all right? Uh, no, I should say no white processed sugar. He's allowed to have cane sugar in some recipes. Um, and you go down through the list. We don't allow him to play with the children in town here because they're wicked. Uh, is my son going to get messed up? Well, if he decides to when he leaves my home, okay, fine, whatever, but... Uh, you, you ask him about stuff and, and, and hey, son, what do you think of cell phones? They're stupid. You know, and what do you, you, what do you think of this evil thing there or whatever else? And I mean, he'll go see kids, you know, in the area and he just says, 
why are those children doing that, Dad? Look at them. The, you know, the boys aren't wearing their shirts and they're playing basketball on, their, on these cell phones and things. What's wrong with them, Dad? You know, we're teaching him that way. He hears old hymns. He hears a lot of preaching and teaching from the Word of God. Um, not just myself, but we play other preachers and things for him. And, you know, we're sitting there eating a meal or whatever. And I'll have sermons on or hymns on or whatever else. Uh, I'm going to fight for my son. All right. Um, and, and let me just say this. I love my father, my, my dad. Um, Mel was his name. I love him very much, but he didn't protect me. I was raised in a professing Christian home and my dad did not protect me. I didn't want to go to public school. I remember the first day. I can still remember the first day of kindergarten. I still remember it. I went and I was crying. I did not want to leave home. And I went over and I stood in the corner. The whole way through the, the school day, I stood in the corner. You know, corner of the, the room like this, just standing there. And the teacher was, oh, come on over and play with the other children. And I just, no, no. I could not believe that my parents sent me to this place called school. And I never, ever liked school. I hated every minute of it. And I was taught evolution there. And I had my morals destroyed and whatever else. And my parents did not protect me. They didn't. And there were kids in our neighborhood that had pornography. Their parents had pornography. And we were allowed to play with those kids. And so guess what? My older brother comes home. Hey, you know, check this out. Look what the Eddie Canoa down the road. He, look what his dad has. Check this out. And I saw my first pornography magazine from my older brother because he got it from a lost kid in the neighborhood that my parents allowed him to play with. And we're talking 1980s, okay, early 1980s. Uh, what is it today? Full video of, of people in action and whatever else and stuff and sodomy and all kinds of perversion right there on your smartphone. You don't need magazines, you know, wicked, horrible and vile. Did my dad protect me from television? No, we had one in our home. Did my dad protect me from rock music? No. Church buildings? Of course not. We were forced to go. And all that stuff. So don't give me this nonsense. Oh, it's not the pastor's fault. Oh, it's not the pastor's fault if the child gets messed up. That is a lie. That is stupid. And Anderson's boys, for them to be getting into the thing of rape and choke, choking victims when they're raping them and whatever else, they had to have been involved in softcore pornography and leading up to that hardcore stuff for a long time. Don't even tell me about it. You get a real young child and they see some kind of a rape thing and and violent sodomy and all this other stuff. It's going to shock them. And it, it, it would be, what is that? Ugh. You have to build up to that. And any of you out there that messed around with pornography, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It starts off with the soft core, maybe even swimsuit type of stuff, and then it gets into the, you know, Playboy, and then it gets into the, and it goes from there. You know what I'm talking about. And you have to get sicker and sicker and sicker to get your thrill in pornography. So his boys to be getting into the kind of stuff that they were getting into, and Aaron Thompson's boys to be getting into the stuff that they were getting into, they had to have been doing it for years, and Anderson had to have known about it. Don't even tell me about it. It ticks me off. But uh, verse 6. Let's continue here. Verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Not supposed to be a young man. That's a novice. Hey, you've been saved for two years? Praise the Lord. Come on, join the ministry. No. <laughs> Lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Right, you're not supposed to just say it. you've just been recently saved and and whatever, right into the ministry. It's not supposed to be that way. And you know, uh, oh, young men can be just as effective as older men. You don't have to be an old man to be in ministry. Well, I'd be careful of that. You need to listen to the voice of experience. And I can say a whole lot more on that one too, but we'll continue. Verse 7, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into re reproach and the snare of the devil. You get some guy that has a bunch of skeletons in his closet, and the people know about it. Oh, no, you know, preacher son, so over there, yeah, boy, I saw him out coming out of the bar the other night with his arm around that woman. And, and, 
Um, no. Hey, this preacher here, this guy's lazy. Yeah, all he does is just go down and hang out at the local diner and laugh at the truckers' jokes and things like that. And, and um, you know, he does. He wouldn't know which way to hold a hammer, much less how to swing it. You know, um, they're supposed to be good report. All right, and that isn't going to happen quickly. You know, I come to this area. I'm an off-grid homestead preacher. Look at me. Um, no, and everybody is. Oh, wow, yeah, you're really good here. And no, it's going to take me a few years. You know. People driving by my lane when it's 30 degrees below zero in January and I'm out there shoveling snow and things or doing whatever else. And they're going, that guy's crazy. <laughs> we just use a plow truck or whatever. That guy's a nut, you know. See me out snowshoeing around through the woods and out there they hear my chainsaw going back in the woods and stuff. I have to have a good report. Somebody gets stuck and I come out and I say, hey, can I help you? Got a breakdown out at the end of our lane one time. And, uh. I walked out and I said, uh, hey, do you need some help? And, you know, and he was okay. But, uh, you know, I need to be able to, to be there for people. You know, so. Um, but let's continue. I guess I'm not locked up or anything. My, So I think I'm still going here. I hope I'm still going. Um, but let's continue here. Verse 8. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. All right, what's the point of a, of a deacon? Well, when you get a larger group of people together, obviously, if you have just a small little house church type of thing and, you know, 10, 15 people coming, you don't really need a deacon per se. Um, it's only when they kind of get, you get a little bit more advanced along in the, in the process there um, that you would need a deacon. Uh, I'm just, I'm hoping that everything... Um, can somebody just write over in the comments? Am I still going? Because my, my internet thing here is kind of weird. Am I still being seen? Oh boy. I apologize if my internet is locked up. If you're watching and saying, no, it's not locked up, you're still fine. I'm hoping everything's okay. All right. Thank you. I'm seeing it what you're saying there yeah I'm not it's it's just I don't know irritating internet um, okay back to it here um, but the deacon issue okay we when we had our house church we kind of had um, the thing of the elder and I was serving as the elder for a while and, and what we had at the time and um, you know, we had another brother and he kind of served as a deacon because he would take care of more of the, you know, sort of administrative, actually, you can't really say administrative type of thing, but we, we were going to go out and do an outreach and, you know, um, let's go out into this area where we're going to track next and whatever. He would kind of take care of that. And then I would take care of, you know, if we had to go meet with somebody, I would go do that um, myself and the deacon and, um you know, doing sermons, preaching, teaching, ministry outreach type of stuff uh, as far as online and whatever. I would do that. So that's the point of a deacon there. But again, you see a lot of the same, uh, you know, serious things there about that, uh, that they're supposed to, you know, have a pretty good level of sanctification. 
Verse 11, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well, ruling their children. Oh, it does. You, know, you shouldn't judge a preacher by his children. Ruling their children. What does that mean? Okay. And their own house as well. The child leaves your house. They're no longer, you know, that's no longer, you know, can be blamed on you. My son, when he leaves someday, hey, whatever. You know, I've told him that. I say, son, you know, I want you to follow the Lord. I want you to do what's right. And someday when you're out and doing whatever else, son, that's up to you. It's between you and God. Verse 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Okay. And he goes on into that. We're not going to bother continuing to read there. Um, oh, well, okay. Verse 15. I should say this one yet. But if I tarry long that thou mayest how, know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. What is the church? The body of Christ. You're just supposed to know how you're supposed to be, you know, how to behave yourself in the church of the living God. All right. Um, I have to take heed to that and say I'm supposed to behave myself the right way. All right. Um, now we're going to go to uh, just go down to First Timothy chapter four. We'll see some other interesting things here. Um, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. People out there, in other words, lost people. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be re received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of, of God and prayer. Okay, you can go through that. We're not going to get into the thing, you know, Forbidding to marry, celibacy, forced vegetarianism, or especially veganism. I'm going to be doing a review on a book that came out, supposedly a King James Bible believer, um, you know, that wrote this book on veganism. I don't think so. But uh, you need to talk about that stuff. Um, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, who is he talking to? Paul is talking to Timothy. What is Timothy? He's a bishop. He's an elder. Okay? He's in a ministry position. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So, if you want to be a good minister, then you talk about these things that are in those, you know, verses 1 through 5 here in chapter 4. And it continues, verse 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. You are supposed to keep yourself in shape as well. Don't just let your health go. You know, I've seen these guys that are, you know, pastors of Baptist churches, and they're, you know, the Baptist blimp, you know, floating around up and just morbidly obese. They're not keeping their body in subjection, right? Um, verse 9, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Verse 10, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. It isn't just some kind of a thing of this modern church type of stuff where it's just kind of, um, you know, nice little life lessons you know no it's commanding all right um you'll see this thing we're going to cover it as we go through this study today you'll see this thing a lot of times where paul is comparing the church to the military to soldiers to warfare to warring to fighting um what do you get when you're in the military you get commands from superiors does that mean that the superior, you know, is somehow a sinlessly perfect God that you have to worship? No, of course not. But you get an older man who has been there and done that, a military veteran, a combat veteran especially, and he's telling younger soldiers, here's the way it works. 
I mean, what would you think of an 18 year old general if you're in the military? Would you respect that general? Would you want to listen to him? Of course not. You'd say, what do you know? You haven't been around. But you get some guy in the military, you, you, you join in and you say, uh, or, or you're, you're, you're a private or whatever in the military, and here comes this commanding officer, this, this colonel comes walking by, and, and he's got all the, you know, um, different medals and different things, and veteran of this war, veteran of that war, you know, he's been all these different, different fights. You want to listen to that guy. He's been around. He knows. He's been through combat. He's been shot at. Okay, um, he knows how to take down the enemy. That's the the whole purpose of a church hierarchy. You get an older man that's that knows the Bible well, that's that knows how to answer the Jehovah's Witness, that knows how to answer the Mormon or the Muslim or the Catholic or whatever, knows about manuscript evidence and things, and, and can defend this King James Bible. He's the one that you want to put into a leadership position. It isn't just hey, let's let's just all be you know privates in the military and let's just go wage war on the enemy and we'll be fine um no you, you need to have somebody there that's been through some things it's had some experience and you know i'll get this thing from younger people sometimes they get arrogant and they'll say well the lord can reveal anything to younger people um then why would he write this stuff in his word that there should be some experience there it's just common sense so a a man that's a preacher is supposed to command and teach. And, you know, you have to do that. Um, I've sat, I, I've, I've preached in pulpits. Okay, I'm not just some YouTube guy or whatever else that, that knows nothing about preaching in front of people. I've preached in pulpits. I've seen the different reactions on the people's faces down there. Okay, I've seen the people that are just, just wanting to rip my head off. And I've seen others that are, you know, and I've seen the others that are looking outside at the birds flying around. Um, and I've seen the people uh, falling asleep and, you know, I've seen the whole thing and I've seen the people that are fervently listening and amen. Yeah. You know, I've seen it. All right. Verse 12, let no man despise thy youth. God can use younger men. Okay. But be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation in charity in spirit in faith in purity. Hey, young man out there, you want to be in ministry? Okay, let no man despise thy youth. Don't worry about it. You're young, whatever. The Lord's doing some things. But you know what? You need to be an example. And how can you be an example until you learn some things? If you're young and you want to be in, in ministry, let me tell you something. The Lord's going to give you an education. He's going to put you through some things so that you can be an example. I've seen that. Verse 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, command and teach, apt to teach. You need to know Bible doctrine. Verse 14, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Again, I've had that done. I've had men pray over me before sending me out doing door to door stuff and whatever else. I've, I've had that. Uh, verse 15, meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Again, the thing of being a, an example, you have to go through some things if you're going to be in ministry, if you're going to be a, you know, I hate to use the term man of God because that's a term for anybody that's saved, you know, in the New Testament here. Um, but the, the preacher, the elder, the bishop, the pastor, whatever, you don't take the title. It's just brother. I'm just brother Brian. You know, don't call me pastor, especially don't call me reverend. Or the, you know, <laughs> that's bad. But um, my profiting is supposed to appear in all. Right? You're looking at some of the profiting right here. And we've struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled. I mean, there were so many times I was falling asleep, you know, driving the big drive back and forth years and years and years. <laughs> um, I've been through some stuff. Okay, I can advise you younger people out there. Um, but the profiting here. Then we're not, you know, a million dollar building or anything. You know, it's a low cost house, but praise the Lord for it. And I know one of you said in the comments the one time, uh, one of my live streams I was doing, they said, you look so much more rested 
and you look more you know happier and more energetic and everything yeah I feel so much better it's, it's just not too far away from where we live so praise the Lord for it um, and I and and why again? What's the purpose of the pro the prophet in being shown with me? Because I can show you. I need to lead by example and say, you know what? Um, the things the Lord's done for me, He can do for you, brethren. Just give up this sin and that sin and whatever. Get this stuff out of your life. Get victory over your sin so that God can profit you. And I'm not talking Joel Osteen type of profiting either, you know. So don't fall for that. Verse 16. Take heed unto thyself, O oh brother. If you're going to be in ministry, you are going to get a whole new levels of attack. And you have to take heed unto yourself. And you need, to, can, you need to check yourself. And you need to be careful. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Don't back down. Continue in them. You, you have to stand true and, and, and stand strong. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that cure thee. I can quote you a number of pastors that I've known in my past, and they failed. Why? They didn't take heed to themselves. And I'm talking PhDs. I've known a few. All right. I've been in their homes. I've sat in their offices as pastors. Again, I'm not just some YouTube dude. I have been with pastors and things and preached in their pulpits and preached in churches and outside of churches and, and preached on the streets and the whole deal. I don't show everything that I've ever done, but I've seen these guys and they get messed up. Why? They didn't take heed to themselves and to the doctrine. They get some wolf coming in there and they, and they don't want to say anything because the guy's giving good tithe money at their church. And they just kind of let it go and they let it go and, and, and pretty soon they start to get pulled away with some weird doctrines and then they start to speak it in their pulpit and then they start having problems in their private life and then shipwreck. Well, let's continue here. Chapter five, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. All right. Be careful what you say to an older man, right? Um, you know, it, it just, it irritates me that, that youth today are so arrogant and just so, you know, a lot of them just get really wicked and they just think, oh, I can tell anybody anything. I'll just do whatever I feel like doing. Um, it's not supposed to be that way. And I have to correct my own son. I do my love very dearly, but there's a lot of times my little boy gets his little attitude. He hears dad, you know, um, saying things and oh, I can just say just the same. <laughs> no, you can't, little boy. No, you can't. And you don't talk to dad that way. And I have to remind him. Children being disobedient to parents is one of the signs of the end times. So if you're a younger brother or sister in the Lord, be careful how you talk to an older brother or sister. All right. Just, don't just go up and just shove yourself on them and hey, you, you know. There needs to be some respect there. Okay. Jump down to verse 17 in 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy 5 verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Talking about pay is what it's talking about. Double honor. You honor them. How? Rebuke not an elder. Be careful how you talk to them. Be considerate. Be kind and just say, hey, brother. You know, it doesn't in, in, in treat them as a father. That doesn't mean you come and say, Father, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned you. No, no. Father is another religious title that you don't take. Okay. But you come up to him and you say, um, hey, hey, brother, um, could you just clarify something that you said? I'm a little confused on this. Um, you said this and this, but doesn't the Bible say that? Am I confused? Did I hear you right? And, you know, that's respectful. You're coming up. You know, I actually heard of a, of a Baptist evangelist, um, David Spurgeon. And uh, there was a Baptist pastor that, that he was he knew and whatever, and this Baptist pastor was sick and whatever. And he crawled on his knees over to the Baptist pastor's bedside to, to ask him something. And I'm just thinking, okay, that's Catholic. All right, you don't need to crawl on your knees. If any of you meet me in person, you don't come don't bow down. Oh, brother. Oh, brother. Shut up. Get up. You know, what, what are you doing? 
all right? Uh, that's not entreating me as a father, right? That's not being respectful, double honored. That's Baptist nonsense, all right? I'm just your brother, all right? But be respectful. That's all it's saying there. Double honor. Verse 18, here's the gets into the thing of paying a man in ministry. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Okay, full-time paid ministry is fine. And I'm not saying, by the way, as I just clarify again, that I have to be in this for the rest of my life. And I just, you know, whatever. The Lord says, hey, do something else. I'm going to do something else. I realize YouTube's not going to last forever. Um, verse 19, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And that doesn't mean that you're miserable and bitter and you get two other or three other people and you pull them together and get them to agree with your little attacks on the pasture. No, that means faithful brethren that are looking and saying, um, I'm, I'm hearing some things about Brother Brian. Uh, I'm hearing he's cheating on his wife. I'm hearing he's, name it, he's getting drunk you know on, on the during the week or something else and and uh hey brother you live in this area have you seen that yeah i didn't want to say anything yeah i've seen it too see and i'm not cheating on my wife and i'm not getting drunk okay <laughs> not at all in either one of those things um but uh verse 20 them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear okay and i have to keep that in mind I have to keep that in mind. I mean, people come up with all kinds of stuff about me. Oh, you preached this thing six years ago, 10 years ago, whatever else, and it's wrong. And yeah, I took the study down. Yeah, I know, but you didn't repent of it properly. Yes, I did. I said it in my studies. Yeah, but you, you know, should it? Uh, you said this thing wrong or you said that thing wrong. Okay, that's not me sinning. Okay, if I say, hey, my opinion is on this and I give my opinion. If that's my opinion, that's not sin. You can disagree with it. You know, one of the ones that the, some of the guys came out with, they said that uh, I said that uh, a pedophile, I believe, has crossed the line and can't get saved. And they said, that's heresy. That's sin. That's terrible. Um, no, it's my opinion. Okay. I gave my opinion. All right. Uh, that's all that was. If I would have said the Bible says that a pedophile can't get saved after they've done their act. I was stating an opinion. I think somebody that goes through the whole transgender surgical thing or whatever, their chances of getting saved is going to be very low. All right. That's my opinion. That doesn't make it a sin. You can say, well, I disagree. Okay. Then you can disagree. All right. I'm just, I'm, again, that's not a sin. Sinning would be me stealing money, you know, um, murdering somebody, uh, you know, you get down through the list. You, I mean, yeah, people understand what that is, but you catch me in that stuff. And I'm unrepentant, you know, like Donnie Romero or something, hiring prostitutes, gambling with church funds, and doing drugs. Then that sin rebuke before all. And, you know, Anderson, when he came to the, the church, Stephen Anderson, when he came to the church, the new IFB gives me so much good you know, material to use to prove what the scriptures are saying. Um, but when Anderson came to the church, he wasn't even going to say anything at first. It doesn't matter. It was a, it was a you know, when that whole thing came out, doesn't matter. And I said, I bet you it's fornication. And, and all of a sudden, Anderson, you know, I put that in the comments of their video. I'll confront these guys. And he comes out, oh, okay, you know, yeah, it was fornication, gambling, and drugs. But, you know, we, we won't stone him. We believe and teach that adulterers should be stoned. But, you know, Donnie Romero, we'll just kind of, you know, you can go on your way there, buddy. It's not right. Um... Verse 21, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring, preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Um, again, a lot of the Baptist preachers, you know, I was very heavily involved in that system. I've met Peter Ruckman in person. I've met Sam Gipp in person, talked to them both. Um, I've met a lot of the other big Baptist celebrities. I've been in the different camps of the Bob Jones Baptists and the Hiles Anderson Baptists and the PBI Baptists and I've known these guys, okay? I've talked to a lot of PBI graduates in person. Um, one of them was a member of my house church years ago. Um, I've experienced with these things. And you get these guys and, you know, there's partiality there. 
oh, brother so-and-so, oh, yeah, you're a good personal friend of Peter Ruckman. Oh, whoa, you know, and, and Peter Ruckman, oh, you know, and, and there's partiality there. And a lot of these Baptist preachers, they go from church to church, and they develop sort of a celebrity status. I mean, they're up there, and they, they have their little scripted sermon that they do. And you'll see it. Peter Ruckman did it. Sam Gipps done it. These guys, they will preach the same sermon, the same joke, the same way, and whatever. Ken Hoven, his seminar, go around and, you know, this is not my wife. This is just a picture of my wife. Um, you know, I, I live in Pensacola, Florida. I have three children, one of each, you know. And they develop this celebrity status and people oh, don't touch the man of God. They're doing things by partiality, you see. That's not just double honor, in other words. That's, there's some problems there. Um, verse 22, lay hands suddenly on no man. Talked about that earlier. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. We all just want so quickly to just say, oh, brother, so-and-so, this guy just got saved and he's doing some great videos and I recommend his channel. Eef. Be careful. Be careful. And if you're recently saved, witness to people. Absolutely. But don't you think about going into ministry you know, after being saved for a month or two. You're too young for that. Right, and I'm saying that not as a condescending way, but because you're going to get hit hard when you get into ministry. You're not prepared for that. You're not ready for battle. Again, use the military. Some guy comes in, some some green recruit. He comes in, private first class, and uh, hey, um, here's your gun, here's your rations, here's your whatever all that you you know need for the battle, and um, we're sending you to the front front line combat. Um. I just barely got here. What? I, I, who are we fighting? Oh, don't worry. You'll find out when you get there. No, you wouldn't do that. But why would you do it in the spiritual world? Very important to understand that. Um, verse 23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Not given to wine doesn't mean no wine. Right there you see it. Use a little wine. You know, and there's some medicinal qualities to properly fermented, you know, grape juice. Okay, that's what it is. Don't tell me it's just new wine or whatever else. Grape juice isn't going to do anything for your stomach's sake. Fermented wine will. All right. Um, verse 24. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Okay. Your works are a very big part of being in ministry. And sins and things like that. You know, and I could do a whole lot of things on that. You know, some men's sins are open beforehand. Um, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. You know, there's some guys that are just messing around with sin and they're headed for judgment. Got a bunch more scriptures, so I want to try to keep things moving here. Second Timothy chapter two. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, okay, I'm looking at my notes here. I think I have that written wrong. Yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter, no, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I had it written wrong here. Sorry about that. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Okay, it starts out here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, you see there, my dearly beloved son. Well, Paul wasn't married. What's he talking about there? Well, he he's, you know, begotten Timothy in the gospel. So spiritually, he's like a father, a spiritual father to Timothy. But there's no title there. You're not to call any man on earth father in the sense of a religious title. Honor thy father and mother, certainly. Um, so you can say that's my father there, meaning your birth father. But no religious titles. Um, verse 3, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Greatly desiring to see thy father. To see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Timothy is having some tears. We'll see why. When I call to remembrance the unfaith, 
unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Okay, the unfeigned faith. What is unfeigned faith? He's not faking it. He's real. He's legitimate. Verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You will need to be reminded of that sometimes when you are in ministry. You will have a spirit of fear come upon you. You will start to realize, oh wow, I can't believe that this is happening to me. I can't believe that that these people are saying these things, that this this stuff is, you know, these attacks are happening and whatever else. Oh the Lord, get me through this. Yeah. Um, verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Oh boy. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. What's that? Anybody that's ashamed of the Lord and of his word, you know, Jesus Christ condemns that. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, the word of God. That'll be a struggle. Your flesh will fight you mightily when you're in ministry. Nor of me, his prisoner. Oh, you don't follow Paul, do you? Oh, that guy again. He's a false apostle. Don't you know that? He, he, you know, his words don't line up with the words of Yeshua HaMashiach or whatever. They, you know, this people come up with these Yahawashi and all this other stuff. I'm not against, against the word Yeshua. It's just Hebrew for Jesus. That's fine. But these people, they're non-Jews and they're using this, trying to use Hebrew and whatever stuff. Oh, you don't follow Paul, do you? Oh, you're some kind of call or whatever else. Or, yeah. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. The Lord's doing things through you, all right? You're not just getting the afflictions because you're being a jerk. No, the power of God is there, and it leads to afflictions. You get kicked around. People attack you. They cast out your name as evil. Are you ready for that? Well, sure, I've been saved for three months. I'm ready for ministry. <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. Need to think about that. Verse 9 Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began? The Lord is the one that saved you. You don't save yourself. Okay? Called us with an holy calling, not according to our works. The Lord will put you in the ministry and say, Okay, now I'm going to tell you what to say. Right? Um, verse 10 but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles the Lord appointed him uh, it doesn't say he you know, got the proper credentials by graduating from his Bible University okay uh, verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. You get into ministry and in that position there, and you get a man that's up in ministry, you're going to see that guy suffer. You're going to see things happening in his life, and you say, oh, brother, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. And, and, oh, boy. Yeah. And you know what I have to do? Me or any other man that's in ministry? Not be ashamed. Yeah, well, you know, let's just continue on. That's what we have to do. Um. Verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words. Hold fast the form of sound words. Don't back down. Which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. 
This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently, and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he minister, ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Part of the loyalty of coming, uh, or part of the loyalty that comes when you are watching a man that you've learned from and whatever else is when you see him get kicked and he's knocked down and everything, you just, you look and you say, you know, praise the Lord, Brother Brian's still there. He's still there. He still feeds us the word of God. He's still trying to get things out. He's still trying to work hard. You know, you see some other brother out there, some other preacher, and same thing. Health problems, money problems, people really slamming him and attacking him and him having to cast people out and whatever else. And you say, but he's still faithful. He still preaches the word. He's not bringing in Catholic nonsense. And, well, you know, I've been hard on the Catholic Church over the years, but I think maybe I'm going to change my stance. No. Hey, you know, I, I've been reading the NIV. I've been getting some good blessings out of it. No. He still sticks by the word, even though people come out and attack him. More and more people come out and attack me, and it's you know, kind of, oh, whatever. I'm still going to stand for as long as the Lord wants me to. And that's important. All right. Um, now let's go to chapter 2. We're going to read down to verse 7. Um Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, strength. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. True ministry will propagate. True ministry will say, okay, I've taught you. Hey, brother, you come to me and you say, do you think I should go into ministry? So are you ready for it? I've, I've advised a lot of men over the years. Hey, you know, brother, I really messed up here. What should I do? Get it confessed. Get back out there on the firing line. We need you. Okay. The, the things that have been committed to me, the things the Lord has shown me, I need to commit you to you. Faithful brethren out there so you can teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Two of my favorite verses, verses three and four. No man that warreth and tangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. There's a lot of projects, a lot of things that I have to put aside because I need to do ministry. Writing back and forth with people online and things and doing whatever I can to help people, send people links to this, send people links to that. Um, I had to shut down the email uh, a long time ago just simply because it got to be too much for me. It was just too many people writing and hundreds of emails a day. And I just, oh, man, I just can't do it. I, I try to do what I can, and I thank the Lord for you out there when I see people ask a question, and some of you will come in and answer their question for them, and, and friendships develop as a result. Praise the Lord. I really do appreciate that. But you look at a guy that's in a leadership position that's, you know, the Lord has put some authority there, and, you know, have some grace for me, <laughs> all right? Um, I'm warring. I'm fighting. And sometimes I trip and I fall on my face and I do things that are stupid and, and whatever else. Um, understand that I'm trying to fight for the Lord. Okay? And if you're going to be in ministry, you will fight. Just a simple way it is. Verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Well, I've grown the biggest Baptist church in all of North America. Did you do it lawfully? Is your church really filled with saved people? Or did you use uh, marketing tactics to get the crowds in? <clears throat> Jack Hiles, <laughs> excuse me. You know what I mean? He didn't strive lawfully. Of course, I don't think the guy was saved. He was quite wicked. Verse 6, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. That works in a lot of different ways. <laughs> um, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Again, I have to take things on myself, right? If if I say, hey, you know what? I can cure the coronavirus. I have the gift of healing. I can cure the coronavirus, okay? Have you ever had the coronavirus, Brian? Well, no, but I, I, I think I could, you know. Uh, well, hey, have you ever had it? You know, and I, I haven't. I'm just using this as an example, but yes, I have. 
and my son had it and my wife had it and here's what you do hey brother Brian now you know do you know anything about going you know off grid living off grid yes I do I live off grid um, I've been off grid in different countries Honduras and Costa Rica I've uh, been off grid in Alaska Montana um, northern Pennsylvania I've had a lot of different non-electric not connected to the grid type of living situations where I've lived for a week two weeks more three weeks and things a month or so I have a lot of experience in that area you can listen to me you can trust what I have to say see I have to uh, be there and um, be kind of a, a first partaker of the fruits I have to you know back up what I'm saying with experience again the thing of an older man comes in there right military application a commanding officer former enlisted a former enlisted commanding officer is always going to have more respect from enlisted men than a just a straight commissioned officer commissioned officer that comes out of West Point or some other military academy He's never going to have the respect of his men like a former enlisted, now commissioned officer. If you're in the military, you know what I'm talking about. You get some old soldier that that uh, he's been through combat and whatever else, and he's been around. He knows how things work. You'll have respect for the guy. But you get some little, you know, West Pointer that comes out and he knows everything else and, and whatever. You aren't going to. You're going to respect him very much. So. Um, now let's go to uh, verse 14 in the same chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. This first and second Timothy are written, Paul writing to a young man that's in ministry. So this really has a lot of the thing of the church hierarchy. What does the Bible have to say? That's why we're going through a lot of the chapters here, um, a lot of these verses. Verse 14, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Don't waste your time on people if they're just going to argue with you. In other words, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that's true for all Christians, but you know what? Uniquely so for a man in ministry, you have to study. I have to study. I have to know a lot of things. I can't know everything. Some people try to put that on me. What about this? What about that? I don't know everything, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. But there are certain things that I have to study, and I have to study in depth, and not just from books. I have to study certain things with life experience. Okay? Verse 16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase on the more ungodliness. Right? I have to block people. You know, um, being in church buildings and being around people and things, there'd be times people be heretical and, and whatnot. And I would have to simply say, uh, okay, that's, yeah, that's your question there. You, you have to have enough guts to say, yeah, what you're doing there is you're wrong. And, you know, and I've, I've had to confront people and it's very uncomfortable and it, you know, it gets really tense and whatever else and stuff, but that's just part of it. Right. You have to shun profane and vain babblings. Verse 17, And their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Their word will eat as doth the canker. You let people that are heretical come into your into the midst of fellowship, their words will start to eat away. Like cancer. Like canker. Um, I'm not saying that canker is exact, you know, reference to cancer, but I hope you know what I mean there. Comparing the two. Verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Um, all millennial type of people. All the resurrection, all that's past. We're all just going to die and, you know, whatever. Um, there's a lot of people that mess around with your future. You know, post-tribbers, mid-tribbers, all this other stuff. They mess around with the resurrection, the timing of the resurrection. Not just saying it's past already, but it's going to be messed up in the future. And they will overthrow your faith. And I have to be there to attack that. I have to know their arguments. I have to study. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Awake to righteousness and sin not. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that. 
I'm supposed to be there. A man in ministry is supposed to be there to turn you from your sin, to preach against sin and to say, here's how you get victory over it. I've been through it. I, I, I know. Here's what steps you need to do. Is there supposed to be hierarchy within the church? Of course. Absolutely. Verse 20. But in the great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of, also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. A man that is in ministry has to purge himself, has to say, I need to get victory over this and victory over that and whatever else. You can know all the Bible you want to know. And if you haven't purged a lot of the sins out of your life, if you don't have victory over those sins, don't waste your time going into ministry. Just don't waste your time. You have to purge yourself. So you have to be sanctified when the Lord calls you into ministry. Remember, you know, good report of them that are without. A bishop then must be blameless. You know, having his own children in subjection. It all ties together. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity. 1 Corinthians 13, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I mean, all of us can understand the basics there of calling on the Lord. It starts out at salvation. You call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, and then you call on him after that. The calling on the Lord there, you call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That's for saved people. But it starts when you are lost and you call upon the Lord to be saved. And verse 23 ties in with what I was just talking about. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. You have to answer them, sure. But avoid entertaining this stuff and whatever. You know, Paul wrote about in Galatians about to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Don't even talk to me about this stuff. Yet. Okay, you're, you're uh, Paul is, you know, your mid, mid acts dispensationalist or, you know, the. The, we can only have to believe and there's no repentance and there, you know, the whole thing. Okay, whatever. You know, I don't need to talk to you. You know, avoiding foolish and unlearned questions. Verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men apt to teach. The bishop, remember, patient. Servant of the Lord must not strive. Well, how's that work? We're supposed to answer people and, and give answers. That's not striving. Striving is when you start to think of ways that you can get in and mess up their system. I struggle with that one. I do. Um, my pride gets hurt sometimes, and I think, oh, I, I can get in there, and I can, you know, I can really make some trouble or whatever. It's not right. It's not right. You have to fight that stuff and say, no, just preach the truth. Preach the gospel. Lost people can't understand it, so why would I try to debate them on certain issues and things? All right? I have to be gentle. Unto all men. And again, you know, you meet me in person, you'll see how gentle I am. I'm not a whatever. Um, apt to teach, patient. That comes with age, brethren. Verse 25, and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You're supposed to have meekness. Instruct those people that oppose themselves. Um Verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Um, a preacher, a good picture of a preacher is a man with a rope standing on the dry ground and there's people sinking in the quicksand around him. He's throwing the rope to this one and saying, grab a hold of the rope, I'll pull you out. Let me get you up here onto the, onto the dry ground. Let you get, get you up here on this higher ground where it's nice and solid and the foundation is sure. Hey, you over there, you're drowning in rock music. Let me tell you how to get out of it. Hey, you over there, you're drowning in uh, pornography addiction. Let me tell you how to get out of it. Well, how do you know these things? I used to be involved in that. I used to be involved in this. I had a brother that was involved in this and he taught me how to get, you know, pull people out of that pit. Yeah. Now I'll go to chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Again, we're just, Paul's repeating this stuff over and over again. You're seeing how this tie into a lot of what we've already read. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You've really been shown this stuff by the Holy Ghost. If, if you've learned anything from this ministry, it's come from the Holy Ghost. 
It isn't something that, you know, the doctrines of Brian Denlinger or something. No. I was shown these things. The Lord confirms them. And then, here, now you look into it. Um, verse 15, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Um, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Okay, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Four different things there. All right. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Good works come after true conversion. And the way that you do those good works is to be firmly grounded and settled in the book, in the word of God. That's the way it's supposed to be. Chapter 4. Eight verses to read here, and then we're going to move to our last passage of scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. I charge thee. Who is he writing to? Timothy. Who is Timothy? A bishop, elder, pastor, whatever you want to call him. He is a man with authority within the body of Christ. Okay? And Paul says, I am charging you. I'm giving you an order, Timothy. I charge thee. Verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I mean, you can just break that down. Just go over that and, you know, compare it to all the other instructions that Paul was giving to Timothy. It's all there. Verse 3. For the time will come when you will become more popular and the people will love you more and your church, you'll see it explode in growth. You'll have exponential growth numbers and you'll have a bus ministry. and You'll have your own school and you're you no know, um, <laughs> for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The most frustrating thing when you are in ministry is seeing people that you thought were legitimate and real and whatever else and you'll see them walk over to false teachers and get messed up and it's not just youtube okay you say well brother brian if you had a real church building you wouldn't see it oh yes i would oh yes i would i've been in churches for years you know the same church preached in the pulpit sunday school the whole deal and you'd see something oh where'd so and so go i thought they all oh, didn't you hear? Yeah, they're going to the Pentecostal church now. Huh? They left. What, I don't, what, what happened? Well, they got upset. Somebody was you know, being a little bit too hard on the new versions. And this happened and that happened. Away they go. They go after uh, people that will itch their, you know, their tick or the scratch their itching ears, so to say. After their own lusts. Verse 4, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Watch thou in all things. Almost like being vigilant. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Study. Work hard. Full proof of thy ministry. Hey, brother out there, you want to be in ministry? then you need to make full proof of thy ministry. You ready for that? Oh, sure, brother. Oh, man, I've learned so much from you, brother. And I, I just can't wait to get out there and preach the word. Oh, oh man, this is great. I just can't wait. Um, okay, but how about the application, the afflictions of the gospel coming upon you? Are you ready to be attacked on levels that you aren't even aware of right now? Are you ready to have nightmares every night, satanic stuff entering into your mind that you don't want to think about? The struggles of your flesh getting kicked around by the world? We're going through some real big stuff right now I haven't talked about yet. Some big stuff is happening. Very, very vexing, very bad types of things in our lives. And uh, some I'm going to be able to take care of. Others, it's just, oh, Lord, I can't believe this is happening. Are you ready for that? 
Are you ready to make full proof of thy ministry? It isn't just, you know, you look at that and you say, oh, well, sure, I can prove things and I'll just have the head full of knowledge and whatever. Oh, no. It's application. Your life experiences. Verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I'm not there yet. I can't say I've fought a good fight. I've, I've been fighting as hard as I can, but I haven't finished. I, I'm, I'm fighting a good fight. I haven't fought a good fight. I'll say it that way. I can't look back and say, okay, I'm done. I'm here at the end, whatever. I finished my course. No, I haven't. There's still a lot to do. Um, and I think unless I get killed, uh, I think that I'm going to get to see the Lord saying, come up hither. I think I'm going to get to go at the rapture. Uh, looking forward to it. I think most of us will get to see that. But finished my course? No. There's work to do. There's still work to do. There's still... Uh, some things I'm going to have to go through. I know that. Finally, let's go to Acts chapter 20. Because here's another thing that's directly written to elders within the New Testament body of Christ. Um, within the what you could call the church age. Acts chapter 20, verse 26. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Um, you get into ministry as a man, you can't shun to declare all the counsel of God. Ooh, oh, you know, we're, oh, that's a controversial subject. But it's really going to hurt the tithing this week. You know. Whatever. Um, boy, if I say this, it's really going to tick off the wrong people. Okay, you know, this thing could actually get me in the law, or in trouble with the law if I say these things. Okay. You have to declare the whole counsel of God. Verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. Be vigilant. Remember, ties in with what Paul's writing to Timothy. And to all the flock. Overseeing the flock. What I'm supposed to do over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood that's the job of a man in ministry for I know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock if something happens to me this channel gets taken down there's gonna be a lot of grievous wolves that are entering among you out there and they're not going to spare the flock um, one of the truths that you need to understand as a Christian is um, God doesn't always choose to spare the flock. You aren't always going to be just able to just get by without getting kicked or attacked or whatever else. Um, you will get kicked around. Now, we don't go into the time of Jacob's trouble because that's the Lord dealing with Israel again. Um, that's very easy to refute that whole post-trib nonsense. But uh, when it comes to you being persecuted... You say, well, you know, I, I believe America's going to fall, but I don't think it's going to be, you know, I'm just going to get through it and, and whatever. Study church history. There's people that get, you know, that were saved and they were doing work for the Lord and they got kicked pretty hard. I mean, look at the, you just read the book of Acts. They're being put in prison. They're being whipped and beaten. Doing the work of the Lord. The Lord's breaking them out of jail and saying, go back and do it again. You know? Something to think about there. Um, verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. Why do they do that? To draw away disciples after them. And I've seen that thing and seen it and seen it and seen it. You get these guys and they come in. They learn from me. They learn the right things to say. They get answers to certain questions. And then they say, now I'm going to go out and I'm going to draw away disciples. Are you ready to have that happen to you if you go into ministry? 
be backstabbed, to have Judas Iscariot type of disciples, people that you thought were friends, and they stab you in the back. Are you ready for that? That's a part of being in ministry. I'll tell you that right now. You're not going to get around it. Every man that's ever done anything for the Lord had people betray him every single time. Verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Um, I have no other option but to warn you out there about false prophets, false teachers. I have to do that. If I love you, I'm going to do that. And warn you and say, hey, stay away from Stephen Anderson. Stay away from Mike Hoggard. He used to be pre-trib. Now he's now he's post-trib, and he's you know against dispensationalism, against eternal security. He's he's teaching all kinds of really bad stuff. Um, hey, you know Peter Ruckman. I love Peter Ruckman. Watch Peter Ruckman's materials, absolutely. But watch out. This he he blends Trinitarian philosophy with what the Godhead teaching is, and he was the one that taught me the Godhead thing. But then he tries to blend the Trinitarian stuff in, and he makes a mess. You know, uh, Sam Gipp has some good stuff defending the King James Bible, but man, watch out for some of his other stuff, his pro-church building stuff and, and whatever, and his making fun of natural health and, and, you know, man. Okay, I have to warn about that type of stuff. If I love you, I will warn you. Again, I'm being vigilant. That's just part of being in ministry. And, you know, as a result of me warning people about others out there, they say then they are all he does is just he goes on these witch hunts or he just goes out and tries to tear other people down and whatever. That's not what I'm doing. I'm warning people. Verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, not greedy of filthy lucre. I'm not doing this thing for the money. There's a lot better ways to make a living, <laughs> as I've said. Uh, you'll get into ministry and you will have the struggles. Sometimes you will have no money coming in. Nobody cares. And you're just pouring out your heart and your soul and just saying, and you're, Lord, I have bills to pay. What am I supposed to do? And and, and somebody else comes along and says, hey, brother, I just got saved from your ministry. and Thank the Lord for you. Hey, do you have a sermon on such and such? And you think, oh, no, I don't have one. And you get right back to being excited and you want to preach the word. And what about the money thing? I mean, it's still there but you know man, I gotta preach this this thing I want to write this book I want to, to make the whatever I want to serve the Lord that's a man who's called into ministry a man who compromises and says well I think maybe I could monetize my channel and you know, I'd, I'd like to kind of go around and, and you know not be too controversial kicking people you know I mean if a, if a Baptist preacher really um, said I'm gonna live by the Word of God all matters of faith and practice um he wouldn't go to baptist churches or he'd go to one and say brethren i'm going to be honest with you this place is not a church building okay this is not a church it's a building um and, and go off on i actually knew a brother that was from pbi a pbi graduate pensacola bible institute if you don't know what i mean peter ruckman's institute that he came up with and this brother um he was a baptist pastor had the whole church building, the whole thing, and he turned against it and said, this is wrong. It's not in scripture. I can't continue this. There needs to be multiple elders, um, not the single pastor thing or whatever else here in our congregation. Um, and he had a lot of people turn against him. Literally, he told me the one time we were writing back and forth a lot. And he said, he said, I called up uh, the Bible Baptist bookstore. And he said, I was talking and things. And the woman on the phone, he said, I knew her from going to school down there. And and uh, and she said, oh, yeah, we have some people that just got saved up in your area there and whatever. And uh, and he said, well, you know, I can get in contact with them. And she said, well, let us know when you have a real church. And then we can put you in contact. <laughs> wow, thank you. <laughs> um, when we have a real church, huh? The church building thing you know you're gonna get kicked you're gonna get stumped so that's gonna be it is there a church hierarchy yes absolutely does that mean that the man is there and he's just got this holy authority and and untouchable no there's a there's standards by which you can rebuke a man that's in ministry 
first and treat him as a father. Come to him in respect and say, your brother, could you please clarify what you're saying here? Don't just follow everything he says. Don't just blindly submit to him. But when, he, when you are learning from a man and you see he's not a heretic, you come up to him and you say, hey, can, can I ask you a question, brother? Could you clarify something here for me that you said? I think maybe I'm just hearing you wrong. And treat him as a father. But you catch that guy sinning and doing some wicked stuff like Jack Hiles was doing, messing around with his deacon's wife just right in front of people's faces, sitting there, you know, he's standing there preaching and his wife's over here and Jenny Neshek, his secretary, is over this way, I think is how it was. You know, his wife and his mistress right behind him, right in front of thousands of people. Arrogant, arrogant man. Gets, you know, does a, a thing on prayer and whatever else, is studying on prayer, and he, he's kneeling down in his office and he's going like this and he's praying. And right behind him is this hidden door between his office and Jenny Nishik's office, his secretary. Then the sin rebuke before all. You have to rebuke him. All right. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, you know, there is a church hierarchy within, you know, there's the office of a bishop and an office of a deacon. And you need to have some respect there. Um, military is no good if there are no commanding officers. And those commanding officers have to know what the overall agenda of military is. They have to be vigilant. They have to be sober. You don't pick a, a commanding officer that's a drunken bum. You want a commanding officer that's going to be there that says, okay, I know how to get through this. I've been with, through this type of thing. You need that. You need structure within the body of Christ. And to just simply say, hey, you don't need any preachers. There's no such thing. We're all just on the same level. You know, just apply it in a secular form to a military. Everybody comes in, just a bunch of privates. Nobody tells anybody else what to do. Let's go to war that way. Not going to work. You're going to get killed on the battlefield. You need older men with some experience to be put into positions of authority within the church where they can say, okay, I've been through this stuff. I can tell you, I can advise you. And you can treat them as fathers and, and, and you don't call them by special titles. So, all right, we're going to open up here to questions. We prayed at the beginning. So um, I guess we'll just open up to questions now, question and answer type of a thing on the subject of the study let's not get into a bunch of other questions too i'd like to hear people's thoughts on the whole thing um any other thoughts on the issue of church hierarchy go ahead and post your comments um i think it's an important subject Breathtaking how brazen people are in their sin. Yes, absolutely. I just, some of the stuff that people are coming out with and, and whatever else. I mean, I saw some channel on YouTube. I don't even, I don't even know who the guy is. I've never seen any of his videos. And I mean, you know, okay, you got tattoos from your lost life, whatever else. I get it. I understand. Um, but this guy has got tattoos up the neck and he's got, his arms are just blue and purplish green and whatever. I mean, there's no skin anywhere there it's just you know the collar of normal skin it's just tattoo tattoos 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 um so yeah but I'll, I'll just say this while waiting for anybody you want to comment on the study any other thoughts people have um i'll just kind of tell some of what's going on right now um but uh okay I, i'll tell it at the end I'm seeing some people are saying some things here. Um, yep. Question, are deacons responsible for wages of the bishop? Well, in, a, in an organized structure, I would say yes to that. Any kind of giving that's coming in. Paul's talking about, um, you know, different one. Uh, one time he's saying about, you know, uh, um, making collection for the poor saints of Jerusalem when he comes and things and appoint men over that and whatever else. So, yeah. The, the you get a body of Christ coming together, you know, the, a group of Christians coming together and they give, you know, they say, hey, we have a need for this or that or whatever. You give it to the bishop. He kind of takes care of that type of thing. Absolutely. Very good question. Thank you. 
1 Corinthians 11 also speaks about what we read in the beginning with 1 Timothy chapter 2. Yeah. Yep. Another one to, you know, study on your own. Yeah. But good point. Thank you for that. Um, can sanctification be done alone? Absolutely. Um, between you and the Lord, there's a lot of things the Lord knows. You can get around a bunch of other Christians and you can fake that you don't have problems and whatever else. Um, so yeah, sanctification is really honestly between you and the Lord. Now you can you can ask for help from other believers and say, hey, you know, I'm really struggling with this. That's fine. Um, get other believers to pray for you. But you know, sanctification is ultimately between you and the Lord. Question: Did Jesus really turn water into wine, or is it that just Roman lies. Um, yeah, he turned water into wine. And the, the miracle of it was that it was aged. It was fermented. And he did it instantly. That's the miracle. If it was just grape juice, um, that's not really a miracle. I mean, it's, you know, it would still be pretty impressive in taking water and turning it into grape juice. But uh, aging it, that shows the, the timeless, eternal nature of our God. He can be there in time and say, okay, watch this. Boom fermented wine instantly um, please do a study on Romans 13 thank you I talked about Romans 13 but uh, you don't have to do that sometime The bishop must be married only once, husband of one wife. Well, husband of one wife means one living wife. There's no sin at all in being married, and then the wife dies, and then you get remarried. Um, I think a lot of these guys that get you know, married and remarried and remarried, and their wives are still living, um, a lot of them are really kind of stretching the thing of, well, there was, you know, we, had, we were scripturally divorced and whatever else. Um, you're not really... You're not really ruling your own house well when you're getting divorced and your wife is, you know, because she's fornicated and whatever else and stuff. So I'm not totally in agreement with uh, Peter Ruckman on some of that stuff, but um, it's fine to get divorced and remarried if there's fornication involved. But I would say you have to step down at that point if you're a pastor because you're not ruling your house well. Question Is it fine to use a reference Bible as your main Bible? I'm using one just for the layout, not for the commentary. Yeah. You can, I mean, you can you can take what you know. Again, you're learning from a man that's that's older. This is a Ruckman reference Bible. Um, that way, um, you know, you can learn some good stuff from him. You, you see a version, you wonder what that means. You look down at the context or the, the footnote down here, and you say, "Hey, you know, okay, that makes sense. That's that's totally fine." But but uh, this down, you know, this. Uh, this down here is not the scripture. This isn't God's word. This is God's word up here. Just like, you know, this is not God's word here that comes out of, you know, that my sayings and things. This is God's word. So. Question. When YouTube goes away or becomes too evil to associate with, how will we have access to your preaching and teaching if the Lord still has you in ministry at that time? I don't know yet. Um, I might be putting out things just on, you know, little USB drives or other types of things. Technology is always changing, so I really don't know. I don't have a real good answer um, to that. Um, I have looked into the thing of Zoom. I'm looking into some other stuff. I've, I've actually heard that you can get a player that would, like a video player that you could live stream. I could live stream, you know, from my actual website, embed the software in my website and things. So there's a lot of stuff I need to get figured out, but we have some big things we're going through right now. Um, Question, anyone from the ministry can baptize brothers? Can anyone from the ministry, can they? Can anybody baptize brothers? Um, yes, I do believe in that. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that it's a thing you have to be, you know, 
uh, a man in ministry or whatever to baptize somebody. And you know, if if that's there, then yeah. Um, but Paul talks about you know you know I baptize none of you, but um, Crispus and Gaius or whatever. I think so. He's dictating that to other people. Um, question: What advice would you give for being on fire for God and then growing cold? I feel like I'm trying to share the truth, but no one is listening. Um, well, if you're trying to tell the truth to people and nobody's listening, well, that's just kind of the course of the world. But if you are getting out of fellowship with the Lord, you can repent. You can get back to where you you once were. Um, that's important. Um, Question, your thoughts on 1 Timothy 4, 3, believe and know the truth, separating belief and knowledge. There is just there is distinction between the two. Um, let me get the verse further. Um, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to receive with thanksgiving and them which believe and know the truth. Yeah, I would say it has to both be there. People that believe and know the truth. I see what you're saying, yeah. I think that there is some distinction there that you have people that might believe, but they don't know the truth, if that's what you're saying. Um, question, how would one address a pastor of a church building on the Bible version issue with respect? Um, just come up to him and say, uh, Pastor, um, do you believe that that Bible that you're holding in your hands is a, is a perfect copy of God's written word? And if he says, well, yes, say then it's without error. There's no, it can't be translated better or anything else. He says, well, no, it's just a translation. Then say, well, then if it's God's perfect word, you just admitted that to me, uh, Pastor. Um, how does that work out? It's God's perfect word, but it should be translated differently. You know, that's a good way to do it. I've done that before myself with different pastors I've known. Um, I'm really in favor of the off-grid style life teachings. I am in need of guidance in that area because I'm about to move into that step of, in life. Well, we, we'll see what we can do about that. Um, I do have some ideas on that. So, oh boy, I'm getting behind here in my answering. Okay, going down through here. Questions. How do you answer people who say that we idolize the KJV? What's a good response to that? Um, well, I would just simply say, um, no, we don't. It's it's the Word of God, but um, shouldn't the Word of God, you know, have a a you know? Well, okay, I'll say it this way because I can I, I understand what they're saying. You know how they would say that you idolize it, but you know it's not it's not an idol because we hold it, we read it, we put marks on it, whatever else. You don't do that to an idol. Um, that's a good way to answer. But uh, just simply take them to Psalm 138 verse 2, uh, saying that we've mag you know God has magnified his word above his name and say, is this God's word? Okay, what's more important, this book or his name? According to the scriptures. Um, question is what are baptism necessary to join local fellowship okay there's a lot of questions coming in here um, I would say I would say it's definitely something that you would want to do uh, required I don't know about that um, is baptism a requirement to go to heaven and if you still struggle with sin are you are or can you be saved um, baptism is not a requirement to go to heaven um, and you will still struggle with sin as a born-again believer but the point is there should be a, a forward movement there should be sanctification that's happening there 
Um, you don't justify your sin. Struggling with sin versus defending sin. You can watch that video I did. Um, uh, instead of YouTube, what about Vimeo, Metacaf, Metacafe, Daily Motion, or Vio? Um, I'm I'm not really into the the video website type of thing. It, you know, I want to get into something different. You know, not just a slight variation of what YouTube is. Um, what do you think about all the stories of people visiting heaven or dying, going to heaven and coming back? Does John three thirteen teach us otherwise? Thank you, God bless. Um, John three thirteen. We'll go there quick. Yeah, I hope I don't get much bigger ministry-wise because the, the questions are coming in so fast. <laughs> it's just, you know, if I had, you know, a million subscribers or something, it'd be bad. Even, you know, 100,000 subscribers would be pretty terrible, I think. John 3.13, And no man hath to send it up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Good verse to use on him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the near-death experiences are, are lies. You, you check out the, you know, you compare what they're seeing with the scriptures. You know, what? <laughs> he didn't see anything. Um, question. May I ask how you knew you would be a pastor? I didn't. I didn't. I just simply, um, you know, I, I just, uh, I simply try to do some ministry type of work and you know really got fervent for the Lord and wanted to do things for the Lord and and the Lord opened up opportunities I'd go to these different Baptist churches and I'd start talking to the pastor you know and everything and, and they'd say would you be willing to teach a Sunday school lesson on that you know well okay and and you know I was very very shy and very quiet you know growing up so that was kind of a big leap for me standing up in front of a bunch of people it was kind of no oh, man and my voice was quivering and shaking and and uh <clears throat> and you know and the lord just kept opening up more and more and more chances for me to be able to speak and i did a few videos for youtube just as kind of a see where this goes i just kind of put this out and um, here i am today um <clears throat> Question, what would be the best way to find a house church in my area or start one? Well, a real good uh, thing is actually being here on this, you know, live stream type of thing, being involved in this, on this channel, King James Video Ministries channel, because um, a lot of times, you know, you say, hey, I'm from wherever, and somebody else will see it and say, hey, I'm from there too. You know, and, and there you go, you establish a contact. I've known quite a few brethren that have met up with other people um, just from the comments section in my videos so that's a good way to to uh, meet up with people and you start to meet up physically and then you can um fellowship and whatever else and witness to people and hey somebody just got saved hey one you know the two of us go over and talk to this new convert and whatever and get them straightened out and things and then they start to join and and it grows that way so Question, is there such a thing as a call to preach? Some Baptist pastors say they got it when they were teenagers. Um, kind of, you know, I think the Holy Spirit will kind of put something there um, in your in your mind that, yeah, I'd like to preach or whatever, but it's it's more of a, a desire for telling the truth and you're seeing it not happen where you're at. And the Lord kind of says, okay, you know, um, I'd really like to be able to preach the word here and I can't. It's, church is stopping me from doing it or whatever and you're kind of looking around and you're saying okay um isn't anybody else going to answer this you know it's kind of like a phone ringing you know and, and it starts to bug you and you think why isn't anybody picking that up you know and, and you go over and you grab it and finally yourself and you say okay nobody, if nobody else is going to answer this i will um but a lot of these these baptist baptist preachers that got the call to preach when they were teenagers 
they're they're looking and they're saying, you know, they're watching their dad and they're saying, hey, you know, or their uncle or the Baptist pastor, whoever they are, they don't have to be related. But they, they look and they see it and they think, oh, this guy's making some good money and whatever. And I could do that same thing, you know. Whoa, I could have a church. Whoa, you know. That's not a call to preach. Okay. So. Another question. Question. What does water baptism do for an already saved Christian in fellowship with the Lord? I feel like, like that would seek, seem like I'm unsure of my salvation. No, it's. You're just simply saying that I've died with Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm a new man now. That's what baptism is. You're burying the old man. You're just saying, hey, you know, just showing this. I, I'm crucified with Christ. Just down and up. That's what it's about. Um, question. What is post mid-trib uh, definition? Post is just, you know, you go through the whole time of Jacob's trouble. Mid-trib is you go through half of it. Just to be very simple with it. Um, so, all right, well, um, I guess I'm going to probably end this here today. Um, but now that we're to the end of this, I'll tell everybody what's going on. Um, the one is kind of in process, and we'll see how things go. Um, we're uh, we're experiencing some vandalism, and I'm not going to say a whole lot about it. Um, obviously, it's about you know gospel type of things being out, so kind of interesting. But I, I have some plans on what to do about it, so I'm not going to say a whole lot of, uh, else about that. But just just uh, please be in prayer about that the vandalism issue here. At the office, and um, just uh, pray the Lord gives me wisdom and helps me to do the right thing. Okay, and the other one is a bigger prayer request. If everybody could please pay attention here, um, we uh, I don't buy new vehicles, I don't go into debt when I buy a vehicle, I buy older vehicles, do as much work on them as I can. Um, and they don't, you know, here in northern Maine, we have six months of winter, so <clears throat> there's a lot of chemicals and salt and stuff that they put on the roads so typically the vehicle motor will outlive the body of the, the vehicle because the rust is just gets so bad well we lost one of our vehicles this year it's not inspectable um, our truck and so I to sell it right now I get a few hundred dollars and it would not be worth selling so I'm just going to use it for plowing snow and for hauling firewood but it, it's not going to pass inspection um, we have another older vehicle and I think it might pass inspection. I'm not sure, but that's our only vehicle that's working right now. Um, our big ambulance that, that was in one of the videos um, that we bought for going across the country and back, um, that thing is in the process of being, uh, I dropped the insurance on it and, and everything and put insurance back on it, let it sit over there because you can't drive a two wheel drive, you know, big thing like that on the roads here in the winter. And um, so, that is in process of being put back on the road. And then I can bring my books down here, which will be right on this wall here. Um, I can start moving a lot more of our stuff. So, <clears throat> um, uh, I just got to say this. Um, yes, that's part of what we're doing. So, um, we'll, we'll, uh, We'll say about that, but uh, um, so anyways, so we found a vehicle on eBay, and without getting into a whole lot of details, um, the eBay seller was a car dealership out in Portland, Oregon, and they had over 300 uh, ratings, like sales and things that they bought on eBay, and 100% approval rating, you know, that they had done really good on eBay and I thought, oh, okay, good. You know, I, I checked it out um, and it seemed okay. So I contacted the guy and been back and forth and everything else. And I sent them the money, wire transferred them the money for this vehicle we bought and, and um, looked like a really nice vehicle and everything. Well, after I sent him the money, he deleted his entire eBay account. Oh boy. 
So started checking into this guy, and there's a lot of people saying that he's a scammer. And I'm thinking, okay, how in the world does he get 300, you know, ratings on eBay, 100% approval rating, and he's a scammer? And I mean, we I, I paid for the vehicle. I have shipping um, set up and everything. I paid the down payment for the shipment. It's literally supposed to be picked up Tuesday morning. And I'm thinking, oh, no. <laughs> Am I going to get some lemon, something? It's not the vehicle that it, it was actually in the ad. And oh, brother. So, and you know, this is kind of what we're talking about in this study. I'm going to be put through some things. Okay. If I get scammed and whatever else, okay, lesson learned. Romans 8 28, all things work together for good. Okay. Sure. Um, and I'm going to be able to help people in the future. So it's just kind of, Oh man, but we need a vehicle really badly. Uh, our transmission could go out on our main vehicle, you know, that we have, and then it's not going to be so good. Um, I have 160,000 miles on on our little Chevy tracker that we have. It's it's you know it's got issues. It still runs, but you know. Uh, so please, everybody, if you could please just keep us in prayer for the vandalism number one and number two for our vehicle issue. I'm just really, really stressed out um, about this whole thing. So, um, uh, yeah, I did. I, you know, click on your comment here. Make sure their seller feedback is good, not just buyer feedback. They had both. So it was both. And um, so, um, So, okay, I'm looking at everybody saying you're praying for me. So thank you very much. Um, we're supposed to know on Tuesday, two days from now, um, the shipper is supposed to be contacting me and things. So um, anyhow, um, so we'll, uh, let's hope and pray that everything's okay. It's going to be a lot of money that we lose if, if not. So, um, I mean, eBay has their... Uh, seller protection or their buyer protection program so hopefully we'll get our money back and things but we'll see um you know uh i go through a lot of stuff <laughs> okay and and i don't talk about it all or whatever else but you know that's why you decide to be in ministry you're going to go you're going to be put through some things so that you can help other people paul wrote about we can go over this um you know, uh, we didn't go over this in the study, but Paul wrote about that, you know, I am made all things to all men. God put him through a whole bunch of stuff so he can be an encouragement to people. Well, that's what the Lord's doing with me. And that's what he'll do with you if you're a man and you want to go into ministry. God's going to put you through it. So, um, Brian, can you give me advice on how to get completely free of a mother with a Jezebel spirit? Um, well, if she's controlling and whatever else, you just need to get away from her. Um, just physical distance between you. That's the best advice I can give on that. So, But we'll end it here. And um, in the Jezebel spirit, watch out for some of that stuff. You know, I see what's, you know, what means Jezebel. Um, yeah. Be careful with some of that stuff, but um, stay in the word, brethren. Okay, um, stand by the word of God and uh, don't forsake the book. Uh, listen to the right hymns, sing the right hymns, and uh, just stay strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Okay, um, so pray for one another and um, pray for me, pray for us. We do appreciate your prayers. So that is going to be it, everybody, and we will see you next week. Not sure what it's going to be about next week. I do have some other studies that I've written up here. I'm going to try to preach this week. It's We've been really stressing out over this vehicle issue because, you know, it's just a, one of those things. But uh, um, we'll see everybody next week, next Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. And I look for some more studies, hopefully, this week that will be coming out. So.
we will see everybody next week. Thank you to everybody out there for your friendship and your prayers.